Hello, everybody, and welcome um, to the webinar, Modeling COVID-19 Infection Rates to Inform School Site Closings and Openings. I'm Shane Kavanaugh with the GFWA, and I'm just going to do a brief introduction to why we're all here. Well, as uh, I think everyone on this webinar knows, finance officers deal with risk all the time, and in 2020, that is truer than ever as risk has taken on all new importance in our work. And Good news is finance officers can use better tools and techniques for thinking about risk, and in fact, I think probably need to in today's day and age and under those current conditions. Uh, fortunately, GFO, GFOA has been researching and developing such tools for a number of years and has successfully deployed them for helping local governments think about problems like the right amount of money to maintain in their rainy day fund or reserve accounts. So uh, with that background, we are conducting a pilot project with Fort Atkins School District to put these tools and techniques in and um, use them for the application of school district openings. And the purpose of this webinar is to show you some of the results from this pilot project and see what we can learn from it. So we have a couple different speakers here today, which are we're going to have participating. Our first speaker is Sam Savage. Sam is the executive director of probabilitymanagement.org and a professor at Stanford University and is one of the inventor of one of the important technologies underlying our pilot project with Fort Atkinson. He's going to briefly explain some of the key concepts about these tools and techniques being used in the pilot. We're then going to hear from Jason Demarath and Matt Millar. Jason is director of business services for Fort Atkinson School District and Matt is a decision sciences expert that has been working with Jason to put these tools and techniques into practice. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sam Savage. Uh, hey, Shane, thanks. Um, uh, Shane, uh, and perhaps I'll be sharing something shortly, so why don't we stop sharing uh, the screen now and I'll share when I'm ready to go. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, Shane has been an amazing pioneer in, uh, in getting risk off to a uh, a large audience. Um, this stuff is easy to explain, as it turns out. The hard part is getting anyone to understand it. And so I want to describe a few things about uh, decisions under uncertainty. In, in particular, I have a concept I call the flaw of averages. So if you can see my screen, uh, a very common uh, Flaw of averages example is a statistician who drowns in a river that's on average three feet deep. You may have heard that even in your uh, statistics class. But it, it basically says that plans based on average assumptions are wrong on av average. And I want to do a little idealized example here. Suppose you're sanitizing a school before the kids come back in the age of COVID. There's a lot of work to do. And so there are 10 rooms in the school that need to be uh, cleaned out, disinfected, whatever. To get this done in a hurry, you've got 10 teams, sanitizing teams, but you're not sure how long it will take them to complete the cleaning. So on average, it takes six days per room. Remember, they're working in parallel, but that could happen, or that could happen, or that could happen. And it, it's very important uh, to open in, in seven days because you know, you've got one week basically to do this. The, the boss comes in and says, hey, when will, the, when will the school reopen? And you know, you say, I don't know, boss, because I don't know how long room one will take, or room two, or room three. And then, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but the boss is likely to say, give me a number. And give me a number is actually the, the fork in the road to hell, because after that, you're no longer going to be able to estimate chances of when the school will be open. And if there's any way I want you to think about your, change your thinking, is we talk about the arithmetic of uncertainty. And in arithmetic, arithmetic can tell you that x plus y equals z. The arithmetic of uncertainty says, what do you want z to be? Here are the chances. My guess is you don't have a standard protocol for doing that. But, but here's your first chance to do that. 
what is the chance that the school will open in six days? So remember, that could happen or that could happen. Thousands of things could happen. The school doesn't open until all 10 rooms are open, right? This red bar shows when the last, well, shows the maximum of those. That's when that opens. So what I'd like to do is now go, go to a poll. What's the chance the school will open within six days? That is six days or less. 100%, 50%, one in four, one in 10, one in 100, one in 1,000, one in 10,000. And, and when you're dealing with chance, like horseshoes and hand grenades, close counts. So one of these answers is pretty close. Um, can we put up the poll? Going on. You could be thinking about it in the meantime. There we go. And I don't want to show you the answers, guys, um, and and gals, whoever's in the audience, it, it, until we, until everyone answers, because I find there's a very wide, wide variety here. I will give you one other thing to think about in terms of the flaw of averages while we're taking this quiz. Uh, I use dice a lot to teach uncertainty, all right? And if the flaw of averages occurs when you replace an uncertain number, like the thing that comes out on the die, with a single average. So you know life is a crapshoot, right? How many of you would practice with a flat die? This is an average die, by the way. It has three and a half dots per side, you know? Can you imagine what a dull monopoly game this thing would make? But if you're analyzing uncertainty in terms of averages, that's what you're doing. So I think the, uh, I think they probably had enough, uh, uh, by the way, oh, a total of 10 results. No, wait a minute, out of 50. So, so now we're really learning some. What we really learned here is, you probably don't have any idea how to answer this question. I think people are having trouble answering the poll, actually, Sam. There, there's been a number of comments. Oh, okay, good, good, good. Well, let me make sure you're picking it up now. We got 17. Let's not spend too much time on this. Let's, let's try to get up to about 20 people. That ought to be what we'd call statistically significant. Hey, hey Sam, it, it just takes a folk, minute for folks to go over the poll of .com slash GFOA Matt. So for, for folks who want to answer the poll, if you go to that URL at the top of the screen. So again, pollev.com slash GFOA Matt. Good. I tell you what, we, we got enough. So let's see what the results are here. I see they're coming in, but. Whoa, 50% was the winner. Wrong though. The right answer is one in a thousand. Now look, when you look at this, by the way, the first thing it t says to me in reading data is, hey, you look like my Stanford students. You know, everyone answers it about like, oh, look at all, look at that 1,000 pickup. I love that. Yeah, yeah, these are, well, these are school people, right? Oh, you see the kid's answer? And then you start putting it in for your own answer. Yeah, right, okay. Nice going, guys. Anyway, <laughs> so, so, so let me explain why it's one in 1,000, all right? If you, if you go back, remember we had all these tasks, each one could be over or under six days. The only way the school opens within six days is if all 10 come under six days. In fact, I have to share one more thing. We, we don't have to, here, I'm gonna share again. Uh, just one more little, little observation here. Uh, so, so remember now, imagine that each one could be 50-50 chance over or under six days. And the only way we're done in six days is if all 10 of them are under six days. Can you imagine someone flipping 10 coins? And the only way you're open within six days is if all 10 of them come up heads, right? Imagine for each one of these heads, less than six days, tails greater than six days. So I wanna leave you with one more sobering example of the flaw of averages here. And Matt is working 
actually I should show two more real quick things uh, because I want to give you the direction that Matt has been headed on this, who's been doing great work in this area. Um, the, the first thing is, here's a, here's a more sobering example of the flaw of averages. Uh, consider a drunk wandering back and forth on a busy highway. His average position is the center line of the highway. This means that the state of the drunk at his average position is alive, but on average, he's dead. That's not close enough, you know, even for government work. And you're in government work. And let me tie this to COVID because we know a lot about the uncertainty of COVID, right? When people, it's uncertain. Oh, I don't know what's gonna happen. It's uncertain. No, 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 did I? We know a lot about this uncertainty. We know a lot about COVID uncertainty, not as much as we know about dice, but Matt's gonna be putting that knowledge to use. Let me show you a model now that um, very quickly describes how we attack problems like the COVID problem. Uh, suppose this line represents our ICU capacity, the straight line there, and this blue thing here represents, uh, on average, what would happen to the pandemic. So what, what happens is if, let this be like the total infections, right? When that, in, when that exceeds your ICU capacity, the mortality rate goes way up. There are these thresholds. So everyone talks about flattening the curve. So we'll, we'll flatten the curve and, and it's good to flatten the curve. We're flattening it. We're flattening it until, until we get below until we get below our ICU capacity. That's great. That's like on average, that's like the drunk is in the center of the highway. And we would say, oh, we had 14.2% fatalities. We got it below that. The capacity is 1% fatality. Not so fast. That's the flaw of averages. Let's look at the uncertainty. So now I'm doing a simulation, which is the kind of stuff that Matt's going to be doing uh, for your stuff. And so the red line is like the positions of the drunk. That could happen, or uh-oh, that could happen, or that could happen, or that could happen. And the idea is, if the line, if, if the red line is below this line, everything's okay. When it runs into the red line, it's like the drunk walking into the front of a truck. So there's the, the flaw of averages kind of focused on the COVID issue. Uh, and with that, I want to pass it back to, uh, to Shane or Matt, who's ever picking up next here. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, Matt, why don't you go ahead and we'll just jump right to you. Um, I was just going to say the only really thing I'd add is I think, uh, um, you know, the work that Matt is doing is going to be very informative and um, help uh, people see what Sam just applied or showed us is going to apply to the school district situations. Matt, uh, take it away. All right. Thanks, Shane. Sam, thanks for those examples. Uh, I always get a kick out of those. <laughs> so, well, my name is Matt Millar. I'm uh, happy to be here, happy to talk with you today. And uh, Jason and I are going to be going through what we've, what we've done in terms of applying some of these ideas. So we'll come back to the idea of chance because it does play an important role in, in, uh, in this project. Um, but just to start off with, Jason and I are kind of just going to have a conversation. Real quickly, what you're seeing on this screen is uh, my forecasts of COVID. They've been published on the GFOA website here since April. And um, this is a different way of looking at chance or, or probability. What you're seeing with those dotted lines, I don't know if you can see that, they're pretty small, but the dotted lines are ranges. So at the end of April, I made a prediction out to the end of May, and the solid black line indicates, <clears throat> excuse me, my best estimate. And the, the dotted black lines are a 90% confidence interval. So and it, as you can see, uh, you know, the goal of a, of a forecaster like me is to be right as often as you say you're going to be right. So I'd want the actual to be in my range nine times out of 10. 
And in some sense, the more narrow the range, the more skilled the forecast. So long as the actual falls in as often as you say it's going to, right? Okay, so anyway, that's just a little background on, um, you know, how I got involved with the project and with GFOA was, was through these forecasts. Um, Matt, let's go to the next slide. So with um, the overall objective, uh, I've been working with the Fort Atkinson School District and the overall objective was a pretty broad objective really. Uh, just improving outcomes for not only students and teachers, but the families, the administrators, making administrators' lives easier, helping them achieve their objectives, um, and the larger community, right? This is an issue that involves or potentially involves public health. So uh, projecting COVID, you know, that's what I've done this year, largely, a lot of what I've done. And then building a tool that has a proactive response capacity. So I want to just ask, bring Jason in here and ask, uh, what were, what were the questions that you were interested in answering at the beginning of the project? Yeah, so the, the questions we had here in Fort Atkinson at the beginning of the project were, number one, we knew what the local county thresholds were for when they would ask us to go virtual as a district. And we wanted to at least get some kind of heads up of if that was coming, um, as opposed to like right now, there's a county dashboard and we keep clicking refre refresh at two o'clock every day to see if the number changed and what it changed to, right? Um, and so it'd be nice to at least have a couple days heads up on what might be coming. And then the other part of it was um, we all have these mitigation strategies that are being talked about out there. Um, I think we're all doing or a good majority are doing a few of them, but then what what effectiveness might some of those mitigation strategies have, like if the high school is all virtual only, but everybody else is back or cohorting, um, kind of those things. I think everybody's kind of doing mask and social distancing. That's pretty mm -hmm. typical, but those other kind of mitigation strategies, what, what might happen if we put those in place? So as we were making decisions to reopen this September, those were the couple of things that we wanted to try to answer as we entered into the project. Thank you. Excellent. Hey, Matt, could we advance the slide one there? Because what Jason was talking about as far as objectives of the tool, the second objective um, was to test mitigation strategies is what you were saying there, Jason, right? Yep. So there's certain ones that are in place. Um, and then as a decision scientist, an important point is you want to talk about the decisions that are in your realm of possibility. So Jason, for example, what, what was the um, what was the threshold for Jefferson County, the county? That yeah. So for Jefferson County, they adopted the Harvard um, guidance, which is um, kind of a color scale based on a seven day rolling average of positive cases. And once it hit 25, once that average hit 25, they would recommend that we shut down and go full full virtual. Okay, great. So, and I imagine all the participants, you know, based on your location, you have different thresholds. Every county is going to be a little different. And technically, school districts have the autonomy to, you know, ignore the county mm -hmm. uh, guidance. But practically speaking, that's not going to happen. I mean, it rarely it will. But for the most part, it's not. And so uh, that wouldn't be a decision that we would necessarily focus on. Likewise, um, wouldn't it be nice if we could all get rapid tests for the entire dis, uh, the entire district. Like, um, what was it, Illinois State did that, right? They developed it in-house, they had a rapid test. That would be awesome, but is that in your decision set? For most districts, it's not, at least not at this point. So from a decision science point of view, we wanna talk about decisions that you can make. Now let's look at the mitigations there uh, that we picked. Um, you see that on the, on the picture on the screen, uh, likelihood mitigations, it says. And then below that, it says high school virtual, number of cohorts, and temperature scanning. So we're going to throw up a, another slide here in a sec that has a, a whole bunch of examples of mitigations. Those are the three that we picked. Um, so, Jason, uh, let, me, let me bring you back in here. Um, would you say that uh, your objectives are the same now in terms of 
what you're trying to accomplish with the tool? Um, I, I would say they, I think we're going to be, I think everybody is starting to understand that we're going to be facing this all year long. And so while the mitigation part m may start to fade away because we have certain things in place, um, but the likelihood of hitting the threshold is something we're going to be dealing with all year long, um, depending so on what's, what's going on. The first one for sure. Um, and then the other part of it, you know, if we do shut down, which I'll talk about what happened this weekend uh, in a minute, but um, if we do shut down, when could we come back? And, and then as we consider these mitigation strategies, do we want to try implementing any of those as we come back if we hadn't implemented them in the past? And if we did, what might happen? Great. Yeah. Yeah. You want to talk about just for a minute about, uh, you know, your experience over the past week? Sure. So, um, so this actually happened, yeah, within the last week. So last Friday, that number um, at the county was about 18, somewhere in the 18 range. And the data got updated late on Friday, and all of a sudden it jumped to 22 in one day. And I had actually um, sent that, forwarded that to Matt, and he said, you know, at that point Friday night, he said, uh, before I saw today's data, I probably would have put closing next week or going virtual next week at about a 10% chance. Now that I see this, I'd maybe bump it up to 35%. And then as, as the data came in over the weekend on Monday morning, we touched base and he said, I'd probably put it to 50% at this point. And unfortunately, one of the reasons we want a tool like this is because unfortunately the data doesn't get updated over the weekend. It gets updated at two o'clock Monday through Friday. And so Monday afternoon, we hit 26 and we had to make the call to go virtual starting the next day. So knowing kind of having that, I guess, heads up that it might be coming um, is certainly helpful. And I guess I'd kind of analogize it to the weather forecasting, right? So we look at our 10 day forecast and I see, okay, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, next week, there might those days are showing anywhere between a 10 and 30% chance of rain. As we get closer, all of a sudden it's Tuesday and Wednesday are showing 40%. And then as we get closer, it's Tuesday is showing 50%. If you go from a 10% chance to a 50% chance, you know, as you're getting closer to it, you're going to start thinking differently about how you're planning, what you're going to be doing outside that day or during that time frame of the week. And so that's kind of, I guess what we're looking for, we're looking to get out of this tool is, okay, we went from a 10% chance to a 50% chance in, in three days or two days. It's increasing and it's starting to become a possibility. So let's start talking about how we're going to plan for going virtual and when. And on the flip side, when we do close, when does it look like it might drop below 25 and stabilize that we could start planning to bring kids back? It was really emerged that um, getting a heads up, even if it's just a few days, about closing or opening is a big, mm -hmm. big value add. Right. I think your, uh, you know, in a meeting with Rob, your your superintendent on Tuesday, he also brought up uh, staffing. Maybe we can talk about that later. But you know, okay. one of the things that we're going to ask on this poll, which we're about to launch, is, you know, what's the most pertinent thing for you now? Now, uh, some of the people attending here, their districts are still going to be um, all all virtual. So that, they might have different questions than uh, a school that's been in person for two months, right? I mean, if you're in uh, certain districts in Indiana, you could be pushing three months. Um, and so you might have a different set of what's the most important thing to me. So we, we're really curious about that. And um, I, am, I am excited to show the tool, but uh, we're going to keep you in suspense a little bit more um, and, and uh, take this poll. Matt, would you advance to the next slide, just show examples of mitigations. This is from Brown University. They have a, um, an excellent data project that they've launched. Uh, we can talk about that in a minute. Jason, I think you were going to throw a, a link into the chat for us. Yeah, I'll throw that, the link to that in the chat. Yep. That would take you to their dashboard, I think. You can also sign right. up, which of course, you know, as a data scientist, I encourage you to do that because um, it's really, uh, you know, if we can get data of examples, we can help everybody. Um, the more data we have, the better. So, okay, so there's that, um, there's that link in the, in the chat. So 
Um, if you get done with the poll before other people, go ahead and check that out. Um, Matt, would you would you launch the the second poll here, please? <clears throat> Um, yeah, so, so while we're launching that, oh great, okay, and it's fine uh, to show the results as they come in, that's great. I think maybe I'll talk a little more about, uh, you know, mitigation strategies um, while folks are, are taking the poll there. We'll see this, you know, when we actually look at the tool. But some of the questions I'd be interested in are things like, which would reduce the chance or the number of expected infections more? Closing the high school or going to two cohorts? How much more or less likely would a school closure be with those mitigations? Those are, those are some of the questions we'll, we'll look at when we're looking at the tool. <clears throat> yeah, I think you see there the, the mask wearing and those things are, that's pretty typical now and gladly we haven't had any issues with staff or students wearing masks. A lot of my colleagues haven't either. Now it's interesting. We're seeing um, we're seeing uh, looks like low numbers here. So I'm guessing that we might have launched the poll with only one, uh, where you could only check one. Um, so that that might be our uh, 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 you know miscommunication on this side. If um, if you're still looking at that first question. Uh, Pick the, the mitigation that you think is, is sort of the most, uh, you know, the highest mitigation, like testing staff prior to school. You know, that's not a lot of people are doing that. Um, hey, Matt, they could select more than one, so. Well, you can select more than one. Oh, okay, excellent, excellent. So yeah, so then, thank you, Matt. So then please select all that are applicable. Um, so if your uh, district is only virtual at this point, obviously, that's the only one. But if you're if you're um, in in person, then go ahead and select all the ones that uh, that are applicable. So I, I imagine just based on the um, the Yale results, I'm sorry, the Brown results, that masks, for example, are are pretty common. I think the numbers on the the Brown website were something like seventy percent. Right. And that does seem to be the most common here as well. Okay, excellent. Let's do maybe uh, 15 more seconds on this and then let's go over to the, uh, the second question on this. Matt, Matt it, can they see both questions? Can they answer both questions? Yes, it, it'll just have to be separate. They're gonna be separate slides though. So once we okay. move away from this one, we won't come back to it, so. And, you know, we can look at the results for the second question um, toward the end, maybe when we okay. get to the Q&A. All right, I'll go ahead and advance to the next poll then. So here it goes. All right, just so we can stay on, on our uh, schedule, I want to leave some time for, you know, answering questions at the end. Speaking of which, please go ahead and, and uh, put in the chat if you have any question and you'd like uh, our response toward the end, uh, go ahead and put that in the chat. And we'll, um, Shane, maybe I can ask you to um, filter those questions and, and maybe come up with two or three that we could discuss at the end. And if not, we'll just, we'll just uh, look through them, see what comes in. 
Great. All right, uh, Matt, could you go back to the uh, slide deck, the slide seven lessons from August? <clears throat> Great. So we're going we're gonna to talk about um, what we've learned so far from other school districts, right? There were, like I said, in Indiana, some districts that opened in late July. There were a lot of districts there in uh, uh, Arizona, New Mexico that opened in early August. So we have close to two months of data from some of these places. And um, we're also going to do another poll uh, so we've got two, two polls. This will be the last poll for the day. Um, so we've got two kind of back to back here in quick succession. This one's going to be a little more interesting, more like Sam's, where we're going to ask you, um, what do you think the chance is of something happening? And we're going to, so we're going to give you uh, multiple choice and there'll be some ranges that you can select. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> so so here's the data we've collected. Um, now you'll note on the right there, let me kind of explain what's going on. We've got 31 districts, 10 that opened in person, five that were hybrid and 16 that were virtual. And um, the second column there means, how many days have they been open when we collected this data? On average, those districts. The third column is, has COVID cases in those counties gone up or down since school reopened? And then the last column is by how much? Now you'll note there is a difference in daily growth, but this is not a controlled experiment, right? So we weren't able to isolate school reopening from other factors. But you, you do see that in fact, in-person county growth is higher than uh, hybrid and virtual. Now, we can't really conclude uh, anything definite from that. We're gonna look at some more detailed data here in a second. Um, next slide. Before we take this, uh, before we take the poll, I just want to come back to the, the chance discussion and, and talk about, because this really is important in terms of our methodology. And a lot of the uh, reason that we're here today is to talk about probabilistic forecasting. Why should we care about this? Now, ultimately, you know, we want to help you uh, make decisions and we want to give you information that's going to help you. And that's the other takeaway. But it's also to just encourage this idea of thinking in terms of chance. So the chance of whatever, the chance of having to uh, close the school because you're over the county threshold, the chance of having an in-school transmission. Now, uh, Jason and I, uh, Jason, I like this idea of comparing the weather. Um, and you, you made the analogy to planning based on rain, right? If you right. see a 10, let's say you've got a, we've got a beautiful state park here in Wisconsin. I know there's some folks from Wisconsin here called Devil's Lake. If you see a 10% chance um, on Sunday that there's going to be rain, you'll probably go ahead with your plans. But if that then changes to 70%, you're probably going to put them on hold at the very least or cancel them, right? The other thing, so the, the graph on the left there is a, what, what I call a spaghetti graph. How many, I can't do really show of hands. Some of you may be familiar with spaghetti graphs from hurricanes, right? Um, Actually, Matt, can I share my screen here for a sec? Great. So this is, um, let's see. This is some screenshots from Hurricane Katrina. Can everyone see my, my screen? I'm going to zoom in here. Yeah, we can see that. You can see that? Okay, great. So yeah, these are so-called, literally, they're called spaghetti graphs. The one on the left is from Wednesday. This is back in August 2005. This is Katrina. The one on the right is from Saturday. So it's really tightened up. Um, the actual path of Katrina looks like that. This is very, a very good analogy to the slide that we just showed where um, different paths of COVID result in, you know, a likelihood of having to close down the school. Now that was a semester long Jason was talking about how useful it is to think in terms of just a few days out. Um, if you're in, let's say, the panhandle of Florida, you're going to be a little bit worried on Wednesday. But by Saturday, you're okay. So if you were planning to evacuate, now you don't have to, right? So this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. We already use chance of probabilistic thinking 
you know, in our plans, in our daily lives. So it's not something exotic. I just want to uh, impress that upon you. Jason, uh, Shane, or uh, sorry, Jason, do you have any, uh, anything you want to add about that? No, I think that's, that's kind of been, you know, as we get into the, got into this project, that's kind of been my frame of reference is thinking about probability and the chance of is, has been the weather. It's something we're all familiar with, right? Yeah. Okay, great. So this will be the final poll. We're going to ask you a couple uh, chance of questions. This will be your, your um, opportunity to uh, think that through. And, and, and um, I'm very curious to, to see the results of this one. Um, there's a, there, there might be a, well, I don't want to give it away. <laughs> let's, just, <laughs> let's just take the poll and then I'll we'll proceed. So Matt, can we launch that third poll, please? It should be good now. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for uh, handling all the behind the scenes stuff here. I know it's a lot for this webinar. My Vanna skills are improving, so thanks for bearing with me. Excellent. I'm going to write these down. And this is Sam. I'll bet we have real data on this. We uh, do. Which means we do. that you won't be shooting in the dark in the future. I, I just want to point out that, there, that we obviously have different opinions here. I myself have no idea, right? I have no idea. But people like Matt collect this data, and again, sooner or later, I, th I thought, uh, Jason, when you brought up the weather, that was just so perfect. And we learn how to trust the weatherman, and we learn how to trust the weather reports. And when the report uh, chance of rain goes from 20% to 50%, we change our, our minds. Our, so, change our behaviors, yep. yep. One quick response to a, a, an excellent question that just came in. Um, the, the person asked, was a student wearing a mask? So um, my response to that is, um, with no other information. So that's kind of a, it's kind of a um, dodge. But otherwise, we could go down a rabbit hole. And uh, I don't want to do that. So because <laughs> there's a hundred very to go into it. Right? Sooner or later, you do have to go down the rabbit hole because that was a wonderful question. That was the right question. I, I often say that building models like this, doing this analysis may not get you the right answer, but it'll get you the right question. Yes. And that was the right question. And I'm gonna be clamoring to know when we're done with this, how the numbers change with the math. So whoever asked that. Gold star. The A for the right <laughs> question. When I teach at Stanford now, by the way, I give students reading and I don't say, answer these questions. I say, ask questions. I want to see what questions they ask me after the reading. I like that. I like that. All right, Matt, let's, uh, let's wrap up. Can we see the results on the second one? I'm really curious to see that too. Uh, let's see. I'm not seeing the bottom of that. Oh, there we go. Okay, it looks like it just launched. Okay, so we'll, we'll wait a couple minutes here on this. We got 10 responses. So I don't want to, I don't want to spend too much time. We've only got 20 more minutes, but while people are taking this poll, I'm going to just talk a little bit about our, my approach when we're building these probabilistic models, we use calibrated estimates. And um, 
And then we use data to update the calibrated estimates. And a calibrated estimate, all that means is um, you can train somebody to be about as good as a bookie in estimating their own uncertainty, their own subjective uncertainty. And when people start, if they give a 90% range, the chance of them being right is actually 40%. So we're totally overconfident when we're uncalibrated. But in three hours, you can be trained to be about as good as a bookie in estimating your subjective uncertainty. So that means once you're calibrated, you can populate one of these probabilistic models and then use data as it comes in to sort of correct that. Usually it means narrow it, right? So this is a good example. Uh, Jason, do you remember what our, uh, what our numbers were for this when we built the model, the first pass before we looked at it? Yeah, data? I think first pass, you know, just talking off the top of my head, I was thinking elementary because they're together, they're not mixing as much, you know, it might be something like five to 10 and high school, you might be pushing, you know, 25, 30, 35, something like that. Yeah, I think our upper right? bound on the high school was like, was like 40 people. Or, yeah, 40, yeah. Now it was a different question. The question we were asking right. is, one person gets infected, what's the 95% upper bound of people they could infect? Right. But as it turned out, and as you'll see here in a, in a minute, we now think that those, those upper bounds were far too high. Right. The chance that somebody infects somebody at all, we gave that, a, I think, a 50% chance or 40%. Now it's 30%. And, and now we actually think it's lower than that. So there's a lot of times where somebody, especially if they're um, pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, it appears that the in-school transmission rates are lower than we expected. We'll just put that. We don't know what they are. We don't know what they are. So we're still in this space of don't know, right? It's this sort of meditative state. We don't know. But we get more and more information. The more information we have, the less uncertainty we have, the tighter the ranges. All right, let's go ahead and, um, and, and zip through some of this secondary research. I want to make sure we have some time to look at the tool before we, we close up. So, okay, great. So, these are, now you're kind of getting used to these spaghetti charts, but these are actual results, okay? So this is not a simulation. Before, like on the hurricanes, those are simulations. Those are computer models. And actually, there's thousands of those. The, the ones that you see are just the best, uh, the best prediction for a certain model, okay? Um, what you saw in terms of Jefferson County, the one that I put up, that again, that's, uh, those are simulations. Those aren't reality. Those are, our, our best guess is based on a model right, on what reality may look like. These are actual counties, county infection levels. And the takeaway from this really is that yellow line, it's not great. There is a slight increase in cases, but it's also not disastrous. Uh, next slide. For the hybrid, hybrid means, um, you know, week on, week off, you're splitting them into two groups or three groups, usually two, um, or day on, day off. The hybrid counties, uh, we see a decrease in cases. Now, it's a little unfair because, as I said before, there's a lot of things that go into this, right? We're only looking at five counties. And you'll note that they start higher on average, something like, looks like 24 to me, 23, 24, at the left side of the graph, the yellow line. So they're starting higher. And so it's a little unfair comparison. But again, it looks like pretty good news. They're declining over these three or four weeks that they've been open. Okay, next slide. And then finally, with the um, uh, virtual, again, we see uh, a decline in the average. So that one looks a little better. I'm seeing a, a question here. Um, let me come back to that at, at the end. So um, we're seeing a little decline. So I would say that maybe virtual is uh, better, better on average than in person, but it's not a big difference. What is a big difference? Let's go to the next slide. I'm not meaning to pick on the Big Ten. I belong to, uh, you know, the University of Wisconsin community. But here are the Big Ten college town units. This is what exponential growth looks like, right? Now, these are the counties. If you, look at, if you look at the actual campuses, the numbers look even worse. But this is what exponential growth looks like, okay? Um, UW-Madison has something like 40,000 students. The county has 550,000. And yet, we went from 10, right, on day nine, it looks like roughly 10 per 100,000 to 40 in 
11 days. So that's not quite getting to like, you know, a cruise ship or um, Wuhan before we knew what we were dealing with or Italy. Those are examples where the, the daily growth, it doubled every two and a half days. Okay, that's, so that's even worse. But these, this is what basically a steep ex exponential, this would be the nightmare scenario if it was happening in schools. Next slide. It's not happening in schools. So that's one of the, that's kind of one of the good news. I love giving good news because it's easy to kind of be dark during this time. Um, but that's one of the good news uh, that we bring is that the data so far has not supported the hypothesis that there is steep exponential growth due to transmission in schools. So let me be very specific about that. And it's so far, I, I'm, I'm continue to caution, Jason, you might want to speak to this. Um, like we've had some discussions about this. How would you, how would you characterize that as, as we brought these numbers, the upper bounds down? Um, I think, you know, I think we're all seeing in our professional circles in the literature that it, maybe it's not what, you know, everybody was thinking when schools open, it might blow up and that's not really what the initial data is starting to show. Um, like you said, we're not there where we can confirm anything. Um, but that's what initial data starting to show. In fact, when you talk about Indiana opening in late July, early August, in on the ASBO International email today, there was an article about Indiana and they're, they're starting to open stuff back up even more because the, it's not as bad as they thought it was going to be to start the year. So, Yeah, and, uh, and I would say we want to see more and more data. They get, uh, the right. Right again, um, you know, an article just came out, I think, in the Washington Post, right, two days ago. Mm -hmm. they, talking about the same thing, that based on the brown data, this dashboard, it doesn't appear that there is a, you know, a large in-person transmission rate. I'm still cautious. I'm right. not cautious just because for me to be 90% confident of something takes a lot, again, because I've been calibrated. Different schools are gonna have different policies. Um, there's all sorts of things. As winter comes in, the air might get drier, we might see different results. So there's reason to be cautious, but largely speaking, this is very good news. And this leads me to be very optimistic about even, I would say, go so far as to say the general path of COVID, I'm more sanguine than I was two months ago, significantly more. That's as, that's as much as you're gonna get out of a data scientist. That's as close as the definitive statement is. <laughs> All right, real quickly, uh, next slide. Let's look at two case studies. First one is Noblesville School District in Indiana, um, 10 schools, 10,000 students. And the point here is, again, their county did not experience, it experienced some growth, but it's not consistent with like what we saw in the Big Ten. Um, next slide. To look at their individual schools, this kind of has to do with that quiz question where we asked if there's three cases in week two. Well, that, that's actually, this is one example of that. Now, it, it, there could be another school where there is exponential growth. In Noblesville, it was randomly selected. There was not. So you see three cases in week two. I would have expected, so just to be uh, transparent here, my guess would have been seeing exponential growth, meaning four on Monday, five on Tuesday, eight on Thursday, right? We didn't, ex we didn't uh, observe that. Week three, they were not closed. They were in school. No infections in the high school. No, I'm sorry, no confirmed infections. There's a big difference. No confirmed infections, but very good news. Three and week four. So uh, in this case, um, there were three infections in the two weeks following that. I don't know how many people put that on, on the quiz. I sure wouldn't have. I would have said, you know, 20 to 50, probably. Um, all right, uh, next slide. I see we're getting some questions in here, that's great. Um, now I can go over um, just in terms of time, if, we, if, if anybody wants to stay late. Uh, okay, uh, case study for Avon School District. Again, same basic story. The blue lines on the bottom are the total uh, infections in the school. And what you do not see is uh, unrestrained exponential growth. To dive into it a little more, Avon School, Intermediate School East, 
uh, one infection week four, three infections week five, that doesn't look good, but then two infections week six, they're still in person, one week seven, that doesn't look like unrestrained exponential growth. Um, high school goes virtual, that may have helped. We'll see, because they're relaunching their school, I think, this week. All right, uh, so let's get to the tool. Um, next slide. And let's, let's just skip this one and go on to the next one. I want five minutes for, for questions. Okay, so um, let's see. What do you want to do here, Jason? Do you want to, do you want to go? Maybe, maybe pull up the tool and just uh, click those couple of mitigations and change those and see All right. kind of the outcomes. Yeah. Um, Matt, would you please let me share? Thank you. Right, so so just, to, just to kind of set this up, like here in Fort, we started the year parents could choose between virtual or in-person. We had about 25% choose to go virtual. 75% um, showed up in person. But like I said, as of Monday, we shut down the whole district because the county exceeded the, the number. So uh, if you click on, for example, as we start coming back, we start asking the question, should we structure things a little differently as we come back? The two kind of mitigation factors we see others doing that we're not that we didn't do to start the school year because we allowed parents to choose um, was should the high school be virtual and should we have cohorts where they attend alternate days or weeks or whatever it might be. So if you go if you click high school virtual back to know you can see expected number of on site transmissions there right 63 if you click and you can see the graphs down there in the bottom you click yes that drops to 31 over the course of the semester. And you can see over the weeks, you know, it kind of maxes out at three or four. Um, expected number of school closures, 1.98, but that includes the one high school that is closed. So- Yeah, you're never gonna get below one. Right. If the high school's closed. Right. Um, so click that back to no and then put in cohorts. We, right now we have one cohort attending all day, every day. You could change to two and it drops to 36 transmissions. And again, three or four, maybe five towards the end. Um, you can see over on the bottom right-hand corner, the initial estimate has it dipping here in the middle of the semester and then maybe coming back up around uh, Thanksgiving as you know people travel and weather gets worse and those kinds of things. So, um, so those, that's the kind of information we're looking for. The other thing, if you want to put that back to one and click on temperature scanning, this is the other thing that I think everybody debated at the beginning of the school year, how effective it might be. And you can see here, there's not much of an effect. And I think, you know, after Matt and I talked through it, the thought of you're scanning them maybe once a day at one point in time, and they could be asymptomatic during that time right but still be contagious so the chances of catching somebody symptomatic with a temperature check once a day probably isn't going to have much of an effect after we talk through the results there of what might happen so the other thing you know, Matt, Jason, uh, yeah oh I'll, I'll, we'll come back to this i, I want to challenge that a little bit but yeah let's okay. go back to it go ahead so the other thing i was going to mention was so now we we saw the data where you know, maybe the spread rate in schools isn't what we thought it was. How in the tool would you change? Like, say we get a month out, sure. two sure, months sure. out, a lot of the schools back. How do you change that reproductive rate factor in the tool? So you can see their expected number of on-site transmissions, 63. Um, and if you go, and if you change, we change that. Sure, you want to change this one here? Though? Yeah. The chance that an individual person infects another person, one or more. Let's change it to 15%. So it was 63 over the course of the semester. Right, 63 drops, right. to, it drops to, 17. to 17. Yeah. And then, you know, that might change your decision about whether making the high school go virtual is worth it. Right. right. So as, as your information changes, now the hurricane is um, in the Gulf of Mexico and none of those lines have it pointing at Florida. Now, I'm not saying we're there because I, I know that we have the data to say that, but 
if we were, if we were confident that it was 15% or that the number of people infected, well, if you're in the panhandle, now you, you can stop buying the plywood. You can, you know what I mean? You can uh, decide not to um, uh, evacuate. So that, right. So, so even though we have, might have a positive case or positive cases like some of those case studies had, if overall, like the brown dashboard or other things are starting to show, you know, it's not really reproducing in schools or spreading in schools like we might have initially thought. We go in and adjust that and we start narrowing our path of decisions and possible decisions and mitigations and start informing what we're doing, right? Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, Jason. Yeah. Perfect. And, and uh, you know, from my, from my perspective, it's all about helping with decisions. And Jason, I wanted to challenge you on, you know, the temperature scanning, it does reduce on-site transmissions by six, and that might look like a small number. Right. And sure, if, you know, if the actual is going to be quite a bit lower than that, it's going to be even smaller. But, but let's think about just for a second, what's the cost of an infection? Well, obviously, it's high or else we wouldn't be here on this webinar. Right. Right. Um, we don't know exactly what it is. Again, it's a range, but I've seen figures of like twenty-five to sixty thousand dollars per infection. Right. Now, an asymptomatic one's going to be close to zero, but you have to factor in the person with permanent lung damage. Right. That's maybe a two million dollar cost over their lifetime or a death. So, um, so my, I guess my, um, the reason I'm challenging a little bit is because six you know, a reduction of six on-site transmissions and point, I guess it's just 0 0.01 school weeks. That's not a lot. But actually we're talking about potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, um, you know, six times, let's say 30 grand, 180 grand. Um, these are very big decisions that uh, administrators are faced with. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, from my perspective, um, making the, even a marginal difference in a, in a large decision, that's the motivation for a tool like this because um, it helps you make a better decision and possibly save some infections while not really increasing your costs that much, right? Right. If you said this is better than this, you may have saved yourself a lot of, um, I'm, gonna, I'm not, not necessarily gonna say money, but like monetized value, can I say that? Does that make sense, Jason? Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, thinking about it from my seat here, maybe the question is, like we all deal with in schools, where, where do we want to allocate our resources, right? So would we rather put our resources into temperature scanning um, versus moving the high school virtual and what comes along with that? You see big Re reduction, right? If you move the high school virtual, not as big of a reduction in temperature scanning. Mm -hmm. Is it, it may cost more or less or whatever, depending on which way you go. But there's also obviously talking with your team at the district level of what's the educational loss as well and the educational value of high That's school right. going virtual, right? So yeah. it, it's a tool to start and form those decisions. And like Sam said, ask the questions. Excellent. Matt, let's go back to the slides here just to finish up. Um, so, so everyone's now seen the, the summary dashboard. There's also, um, oh, it looks like I'm still sharing. There's also within each one of those summary numbers is a Monte Carlo. So there's, there's simulations running in the background. And I think on the final slide, we show just one example um, an interesting trial because it's this is sort of a worst case scenario trial. If you go to the next slide, um, but this is one of those. You remember those spaghetti graphs, right? Was, this is one line on that spaghetti graph. This is the bad one. This is a bad one where there's it looks like hundreds of transmissions. There's other ones where there's zero. There's a lot of them where there's zero transmissions. We don't really know. That's kind of the again we're in that don't know state. But that doesn't mean we have to be helpless. We can average those together. Um, and when you know, uh, Sam talks about flaw of averages, um, so there's places where you don't wanna make decisions based on the average. There's other times where you do wanna know the difference in averages based on different mitigations. Sam, would you, would you agree with that? I mean- Yeah, well, but more than that, you can estimate the chances of these bad things happening. Right. 
right? Mm -hmm. Look, averages play a role. I, I want to say that, first of all, I thank everybody for showing up. I want to give thank an A-plus to Matt and Jason on this. But I want you to understand the, the models not only help you estimate the chances, but they teach you how to think about this. They teach you how to ask the right questions. And I, I, I would say that we're that would be great to put a model like that into phase three trials, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> you, there's a lot of learning to take place. I, I, I see 140 people participating in this, which is just a fantastic turnout. And uh, I, I'm hoping that the GFOA can continue down this path with, with Matt and, and Jason and I'm certainly interested in it myself in related work I'm doing. Um, and with, 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 a, with a good group of intelligent people looking at this, uh, I think it will bring great, great value the way those weather maps do. Hey, Matt, could we advance to the next slide? I know we're over time. If you have to leave, uh, feel free. But I'd also like to, um, to look at some of these questions. Uh, Shane, did you, uh, do you have any uh, questions in there that you wanted to highlight? Um, yeah, I think there's a number of questions that we could handle. And I guess maybe one question I might have is for Jason. Oh, that's the end of the slide. Matt, you can go back. Sorry, that's, uh, we're, we're done. Uh, you can get uh, contact information from GFOA if you want to contact me. Go ahead, Jane, sorry. Yeah, so, well, there's a, maybe some technical questions that people have and we'll, we can answer those. And one question was, how many likely mitigation procedures can be used so meaning you were talking about um, cohorts and um, temperature scanning, but you know, there might be other things like personal dividers, um, letting number of people in bathroom, lunch and cafeteria, that sort of thing. So can you yeah. speak a little bit about the number of mitigation procedures that can be modeled? So I, I think I understand the question to, to mean how many things could I test? Yeah. Uh, but I, I'll first point out that you can, you can program a baseline in, right? So when I was building the model with Jason, I took the things that they were already doing uh, into account. So if you're already doing it, there's not really a decision unless you're thinking of stopping it. Yeah. Uh, and then I guess the other, the other response would be, yeah, you can model, you can model all of them. Um, those all, a lot of those look like what I would call operational decisions. Uh, you know, a good operations manager for a school would be thinking about all of those things. Um, lunch in the cafeteria is a big one. Uh, for me, you know, I, I think that's probably the most important one, actually, uh, where, where I see a lot of like schools doing it and a lot of schools not doing it. Um, just based on my understanding and knowledge of propagation of this particular disease, um, that's a big one. Right. Well, I think you bring up a great point, Matt, is there's a cost to building these models, right? Like nothing is free in life. You know, there's going to yeah. be like time and energy that has to be put into it. And you wouldn't want to spend time and energy modeling a thing that is not an uncertainty. Like, you know what? We're wearing masks. We're not going to stop wearing masks. Um, there's right. no point to like build that into the model. So I think that's a, that's a great point. Yeah. What's the information value? Because there's a cost to modeling. So, you know, with, with Fort Atkinson, I, I came, with, came up with three as, as what yeah. seems the right number. Well, and here's a question for Jason. Um, so, Jason, earlier on, you mentioned the site, you gave this story, which is an excellent story, of um, how over the weekend the information evolved and kind of by Monday you had, you were essentially ahead of the curve of what the, you know, county government data was, uh, you know, based on where that was coming from. And so to use this, the weather metaphor, so you knew it was going to rain or you had a pretty good idea that there was a chance of rain, shall we say. Um, what did you do differently? Because we were talking about like, you know, hey, if you know it's going to rain, you'll at least bring an umbrella. Um, so it sounds like if I understood correctly, you had access to information that said, you know, there's a better chance of rain than perhaps, you know, I thought just a few days ago. Now that I have this information, what did you do differently? Sorry, was that was that a question for me? I got got kicked out or something, came back in. Oh yeah, sorry. I caught you nope, I caught it. So what do we do differently? I think um, basically I you know, I had contacted Matt on Monday morning. We were having an admin team here Monday morning. Unfortunately, like I said, the 
we got two days of data on Monday afternoon, which put us over. And um, so we were in touch with the epidemiologist as well. That was um, that puts the data out there. Um, and I think we all kind of started thinking that, yeah, it might even go above 25 this afternoon. So what are we going to do um, as opposed to just kind of waiting for it to refresh on, on the website? All right, very good. All right, um, let's see if there are any other questions. I know um, Matt has been helpfully answering some of the more technical questions that folks have been asking. So if you have any questions for Matt or Jason, please put them in the chat and this is your chance. Shane, if they wanted more information or uh, if they wanted to reach out and uh, you know contact Jason or me, how would you recommend they do that? Sure. Well, so I think we're going to be um, continuing to work, of course, with um, Sam was implying earlier, we're going to continue to work with Matt and Jason on this pilot. And things are, um, as you can see here, making good progress. So um, why don't we, we'll send out an email to the folks that have um, participated in this webinar with kind of what might be some next steps for them to take if they're interested in learning more about this beyond the webinar. Shane, your video is still off. We should oh, say okay. goodbye. Thank you. Sorry about that. And Shane deserves a lot of credit for pulling this thing together. As yeah, well. thank you so much, Shane. Thank you, GFOA. Yeah, thank you. Oh, no problem. Thank everybody here for uh, participating as well as our participants on our webinar for uh, being a part of this. and. Uh, helping us on this journey because it's uh as you know I think we've all been saying this is a, a different way of thinking and you know we all have to work on this different way of thinking together to get a better handle on 2020 and all the <laughs> risks that are kind of like to say inherent in living in this day and age. I, I want to make one more comment on the model. People are often asking me when will my model be done? That's a question like when will my kid be done? No. <laughs> It's a growing living thing. This one is embryonic. And I, I just think that Matt's done great work and Jason plugged away on this. I, I think this should be the beginning of really an educational program and a growing program where we find out how these things really work in practice. Uh, it, it's, it's been very impressive. I, I, I thank everyone doing such right. great jobs on this. Well, actually, Sam, a couple so, more questions. Could well, come yeah, one, there's one other question here, Shane, sorry to, to step right. in from beyond here. Um, uh, are students more likely to contract COVID on a bus versus that in the schoolroom? And if so, by how much, if you have any kind of commentary on that, uh, Matt, uh, I'm sure Jeff would appreciate it. Yeah, I don't have any data on that. I think here's another question that came in as well. I think this is a good question is how long does it take to build a model like this? Because that is probably the so three really weeks. three. Well, what was that Matt? Three weeks. Three yeah, weeks. Three, three weeks and I think, yeah, I think we'll be doing some final touches next week and, and kind of, turn, you know, turning into that living model. Right. So yeah, it, well, we started the end of August. And I'd also say that, that, that it doesn't take three weeks every time you do, do a new school system. You, you guys are going to get right. better at this. You're going to have a steep yeah. learning curve here for a while. That's right. And, and I think there should be a system where this can be offered on a much broader basis once it's tested, mind you, right? That we, we have to really see how these things work in practice. Yeah, uh, yeah. My I, vision I'm is very encouraged by this. Like my blue sky vision would be that this would, I'd build this out on an app. Right. And then it's, it's, um, there'd be enough like ways that you could uh, just set it up yourself that you wouldn't even need me. It's more of a product. Um, or you could, but you'd have to have it updated weekly with the latest data. We'd need the latest data. Right. From the there'd be a lot of work latest data. in that app developed. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I can just, I can just mention that, you know, as I was, as we were working with GFOA, as I was working with Matt, my intention having been involved in this, the Wisconsin ASBO and GFOA smarter school spending. It is, my intention was to have a conversation with Matt about, you know, if this could be built out larger across the nation or whatever it might be, how might we be able to implement different kinds of um, 
metrics that, that are different all over the place because nobody's using the same thing and and the mitigations and what kind of mitigations might people be looking at and I think all of that is starting to pop up nationally like you saw on the brown um, dashboard but that in this pilot project that was also part of my intent you know in the profession was to be able to help build something that could be used by others just than Fort Atkinson, right? That's great. All right, cool. Okay, well, good. Um, um, I think we have probably answered all the questions at this point. Um, so with that, um, I just want to thank again everybody um, for attending our webinar and thank our panelists for uh, participating and especially um, Jason and Matt for being the intrepid um, we'll say like a pilot project participants in doing this work. Thank you. Thank you. So long.